Welcome back to Speedy Movie Recap, today, I will share with you a very famous sci-fi film in 2021, title is Dune, spoilers ahead, watch out and enjoy this video. In voiceover, Chani, a young native Freeman woman, explains that the outsiders who have come to her planet of Iraqis, also known as Dune, have treated her people cruelly as they've colonized the planet for its supply of spice. A group of Freeman attack spice harvesters before being beaten back. In VO, Chani says the Harkonnen family had come to the planet long before she was born, and Spice had made the family even wealthier than the Emperor. While the Freemen have been unable to repel the outsiders, one day the Harkonnens and their people left by order of the Emperor. She questions why the Emperor gave this order, and wonders who the next oppressors will be. Paul Atreides awakens on Kaladin, the homeworld of House Atreides. He breakfasts with his mother, Lady Jessica, who is a member of the Bene Gesserit. Paul tries and fails to use the voice, a Bene Gesserit skill, and she tells him that such skills take years to learn. Lady Jessica asks if he's had more dreams. We see that he's dreamt of Chani, but he lies and says no. Paul studies up on the planet of Iraqis. The world is hot and dry, plagued by powerful sandstorms. Only the native tribes, known as the Freeman, have adapted well enough to survive on their own. The Freemen share the deep regions of the desert with giant sandworms, which they call Shihilid. Long exposure to spice has given the Freemen their characteristic blue eyes. The Freemen are considered dangerous, and their attacks make spice harvesting dangerous. The Freemen consider spice to be a sacred hallucinogen that preserves life and has many health benefits. The Imperium uses spice to help navigators of the Spacing Guild to navigate through safe paths between the stars. Without spice, interstellar travel would be impossible, making spice the most valuable substance in the universe. Paul and his parents, including Duke Leto, welcome the Herald of the Change, who has arrived with members of the Imperial Court, representatives of the Spacing Guild, and a sister of the Bene Gesserit, to relay orders from the Emperor. House Atreides will take control of Iraqis and serve as its steward. Duke Leto accepts on behalf of House Atreides. Paul meets with Duncan Idaho, the sword master of House Atreides. Paul asks for Duncan to take him with him when Duncan leaves for Iraqis with an advance team. Duncan declines, saying he'd be court-martialed. Paul tells Duncan about premonitory dreams he's had of Iraqis, of the desert, a mysterious Freeman girl, and Duncan himself with the Freeman. In his dreams, he also saw Duncan lying dead in battle. Duncan still refuses to take Paul with, not believing in the dreams. Paul goes to see his father, Duke Leto. He requests to be allowed to accompany Duncan to Iraqis, but Leto refuses, telling Paul that he is the future of the house. Leto says that he will need Paul at his side when he himself arrives on Iraqis. He believes that, in taking Iraqis away from House Harkonnen and giving it to House Atreides, the Emperor has set the stage for a war that will weaken both powerful houses and strengthen his own position of power. Duke Leto has sent Duncan ahead with an advance team to establish contact with the Freeman and forge an alliance against the Harkonnens. Paul casts doubt on whether he's meant to be the leader of House Atreides someday. Duke Leto says that he had such doubts himself when he was young but that no matter what Paul chooses, he will still be his son. Paul trains at sword fighting with Gurney Halleck, the weapons master of House Atreides. They use a type of force field shield to prevent the blades from penetrating. Paul is reluctant to train, but Gurney pushes him on, and they fight to what would have been a mutual death if not for the shields. Paul doesn't seem to take the training seriously. Gurney warns him of what Hazu Atreides will soon face. The Harkonnens were in control of Iraqis for 80 years, the spice giving them immense wealth, and control of the spice has now been taken from them. Gunny tells Paul that the Harkonnens are inhuman and brutal. On Gady Prime, the homeworld of House Harkonnen, Beast Raven, nephew of Baron Harkonnen, meets with his uncle to tell him that all of their ships have left Iraqis. He asks the Baron how they could let this happen, how the Emperor could take the planet from them and give it to House Atreides. The Baron says mysteriously that a gift is not always a gift, House Atreides is on the rise, and the Emperor is a dangerous, jealous man. Back on Kaladin, Lady Jessica wakes her son, telling him to dress and follow her. When he's ready, she tells him that the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim, her teacher at the Bene Gesserit School, and now the truth's heir to the Emperor, is there and would like to meet Paul and learn about his dreams. Dr. Yu, in the employ of House Atreides, checks Paul's vitals before the meeting with the Reverend Mother. Dr. Yu whispers to Paul that while the Bene Gesserit claim to serve the greater good, they also serve their own designs. 
He tells Paul to proceed with caution. He then declares so Lady Jessica can hear that Paul's heart is strong. Before taking Paul to meet the Reverend Mother, Lady Jessica uses sign language to tell him to remember his training. The Reverend Mother says Paul has defiance in his eyes, just like his father. She orders Lady Jessica to leave them alone. Lady Jessica tells her son that he must do everything the Reverend Mother tells him before hurrying out of the room. Paul is angry that the woman gave an order to his mother, but she uses the voice to draw him to her and force him to his knees. The Reverend Mother instructs Paul to place his right hand in a box as she holds a poison needle to his neck. If he takes his hand out of the box before she tells him to, she will pierce him with the needle, killing his instantly. She tells him that his other is outside the door and will let no guards past her. As the pain sets in and he starts to groan aloud, Lady Jessica recites the litany against fear outside the door. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Paul passes the test and is allowed to take his hand from the box. He sees that his hand is uninjured. The Reverend Mother tells him that if he had been unable to resist his impulses, like an animal, she would have had to kill him because he has inherited too much power. He thinks she means because he is the son of the Duke, but she corrects him because he is the son of Lady Jessica. She says he has inherited more than one birthright. She calls Jessica back in. The Reverend Mother asks about Paul's dreams. He says he had one that night. In the dream, he saw a girl from Iraqis and says he's dreamt of her many times. The Reverend Mother asks if he's ever had dreams that happened later just as they had in the dream. He says not exactly, and she gets up to leave, telling him that she hopes he lives. As they walk out together, Lady Jessica asks the Reverend Mother if she had to go so far, but the Reverend Mother says that Jessica chose to train Paul in the way of the Bene Gesserit, in defiance of their rules, and so Paul had to be tested. The Reverend Mother laments that so much potential was wasted on a male. Jessica had been instructed to bear only daughters, but her pride had led her to believe that she could give birth to the Kwisatz Haderach, a sort of messiah figure. The Reverend Mother says that if he is the chosen one, he has a long way to go, and that while his sight has barely awakened, he now goes into the fire. Lady Jessica finds that Paul has overheard their conversation. He accuses the Bene Gesserit of steering the Imperium's politics from the shadows, but his mother tells him there's more to it than that. The Bene Gesserit has worked for generations to bring forth the One, a mind powerful enough to bridge space and time, the past, and the future. She hints that they believe he may be that person, and Paul seems saddened that he's just part of a plan. Paul and House Atriides leave Kaladin and arrive on Iraqis. They are greeted by cheers from Freeman onlookers. Paul sees Thufir Hawat, the Mentat of House Atriides. Thufir warns Paul not to trust the warm welcome by the Freeman. As Paul boards an ornithopter with his mother, he asks her what the Freeman were shouting. Lady Jessica says they were shouting Lisan al Gabe, meaning voice from the outer world, their term for Messiah. She says this shows the Bene Gesserit have been working on Iraqis to prepare the way and that the natives have been waiting for centuries for the Lisan al Gabe. She says they see the signs in Paul. Paul says the freemen merely see what they've been told to see. They fly to the city of Arakim, which is protected by a wall from the weather and the sandworms. Surveying the city, Duke Leto points out what he thinks are vulnerable points to Gurney, a spaceport and a spice refinery. He tells Gurney to guard them well, if they can't refine spice and ship it off-world, they are finished. Lady Jessica interviews several candidates for a housekeeper, all of them freemen. One woman has a knife, which the woman says is meant as a gift. She unsheathes the blade and asks if Lady Jessica knows what it is. Jessica says that it is a Chris knife. When the woman asks if she knows its meaning, Lady Jessica signs to her guard to prepare for violence before answering that the knife is a maker, one of the freemen terms for the sandworms. The woman reacts dramatically sheathing the knife and handing it to Jessica, confirming that it is indeed a tooth of Shihilid. Paul meets a man who is watering date palm trees. The man explains that each tree drinks the water of five men each day. Twenty trees, one hundred lives. Paul asks if they should get rid of the trees, but the man says the trees are sacred. Alone in his room, Paul learns more about the planet of Iraqis. The most dangerous organism on the planet is the sandworm, which can grow to over 400 meters in length. To avoid attracting sandworms, the freemen cross the desert using the sand walk, 
a special walk using an irregular rhythm that mimics the natural sounds of the desert. Paul then notices a hunter-seeker, a tiny floating machine used by assassins, entering through a small hole in the wall. The device finds Paul and flies at him, but stops before it can reach him. As a servant enters the room, Paul grabs the device in his hand, destroying it. He says the operator of the hunter-seeker must be nearby. They find the assassin, who is now dead, in the wall. He'd been cemented into a crevice in the wall weeks before, biding his time until he could send the hunter-seeker through a water pipe to kill Paul. A Bene Gesserit sister meets with Baron Harkonnen and his mentat, Piter de Vries. He asks what the message is from the Emperor. She tells him that the Emperor will strengthen Harkonnen's forces with his own elite military force, the Sardaukar, but that nobody can ever know about it. Harkonnen says there are no satellites over Iraqis, and that the Atriidesis will die in the dark. The sister tells Harkonnen that he may kill Duke Leto, but that he must allow Lady Jessica and Paul the dignity of exile. Harkonnen gives his word that he will not harm Lady Jessica or Paul. However, after she leaves, the Baron makes it clear to his mentat that he has no plans to let either the woman or her son live. At a strategy meeting, Thufar Hawad informs the Duke that he has gotten his hands on the Harkonnen's account books, and they were taking 10 billion Solaris out of Iraqis each year. He says that House Atriides won't see those kinds of profits for a while with the equipment the Harkonnens left them. The group goes out to see the spice silos, many of which were sabotaged by the Harkonnens. Paul says there is supposed to be a judge of change to oversee and arbitrate the transition of Iraqis. Thufar says the emperor appointed Dr. Leet Kynes, an eccentric imperial ecologist, to this position. Duncan arrives and tells about his mission to find the Freeman. He lived with the Freeman at a community for four weeks. He's learned that there are millions of Freeman on Iraqis, some located in tunnels below ground, far above the Harkonnen estimate of 50,000. Duncan has brought Stilgar, the leader of a Freeman tribe, to meet the Duke. Leto's guards are wary of letting Stilgar in because he has a Chris knife that he refuses to hand over. After Duncan tells them that the Chris knife is sacred to the Freeman, Leto allows the man in. After Leto greets him, Stilgar spits on the ground. Leto and his guards take this as a sign of disrespect until Duncan makes it clear that this is a sign of respect, that Stilgar is offering the gift of his body's moisture. Leto and his people respond in kind, spitting on the ground. Stilgar tells them that they are outworlders who take spice and give nothing in return. Leto says he knows the Freemen have suffered under the Harkonnens, but that he will give them what is in his power to give. Stilgar asks only that they stay out of the desert, that they don't seek out the Freeman sieges or bother them, and to just take the spice and go. Paul speaks up, asking Stilgar to stay. Stilgar says he cannot stay, but says in his native tongue that he recognizes Paul. He then leaves. Thufar says that their plan is bearing fruit, but will take time. Duncan shows them some of the technology he's borrowed from the Freeman, including a para compass, which can tell direction despite magnetic interference from the planet's moons which prevents a traditional compass from working correctly. Duke Leto and his people meet Dr. Leet Kynes. The woman inspects the integrity of the still suits of Leto and Paul, explaining that the heat of the Iraqis desert would kill them in less than two hours if they didn't have the suits. The suits help to keep the wearer cool, while recycling the body's moisture lost through sweat, allowing the wearer to drink the recycled water. Dr. Kynes is impressed at the way Paul is wearing his suit in a non-standard fashion. She asks who taught him to do this, but he says it just felt like the right way. Dr. Kynes says something in the native Freeman tongue. Paul asks if she's a Freeman, and she says that she's been accepted by them. 